A reading from the second book of Samuel. The Lord spoke to Nathan and said, Go tell my servant David, when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. It is he who shall build a house for my name, and I will make his royal throne firm forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me, and your throne shall stand firm forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The son of David will live forever. The son of David will live forever. The promises of the Lord I will sing forever. Through all generations, my mouth shall proclaim your faithfulness. For you have said, my kindness is established forever. In heaven, you have confirmed your faithfulness. The, the son, son of, of David, David will live, live forever. forever. <clears throat> I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. Forever will I confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. The son of David will live forever. He shall say of me, you are my father, my God, the rock, my savior. Forever I will maintain my kindness toward him and my covenant with him stands firm. The son of David will live forever. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, it was not through the law that the promise was made to Abraham and his descendants that he would inherit the world, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. For this reason, it depends on faith so that it may be a gift and the promise may be guaranteed to all his descendants. Not to those who only adhere to the law, but to those who follow the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into being what does not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, thus shall your descendants be. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. 
Such was his intention, when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, quick question. How many of you all here would rather hear me preach than Pope Francis? Oh, man, and I had checks ready for you. Okay, just for that, you're going to get Pope Francis. This is excerpts from his inauguration mass homily. In the gospel, we heard that Joseph did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife. These words already point to the mission which God entrusts to Joseph. He is to be the custos, the protector. Protector of whom? Of Mary and Jesus. But this protection is then extended to the church, as blessed Pope John Paul II pointed out. How does Joseph exercise his role as protector? Discreetly, humbly, and silently, but with an unfailing presence and utter fidelity, even when he finds it hard to understand. From the time of his betrothal to Mary until the finding of the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple of Jerusalem, he is there at every moment with loving care. He is the spouse of Mary. He is at her side in good times and bad, on the journey to Bethlehem for the census, and in the anxious and joyful hours when she gave birth, amid the drama of the flight into Egypt, and during the frantic search for their child in the temple, and later in the day-to-day -day life of the home of Nazareth, in the workshop where he taught his trade to Jesus. How does Joseph respond to his calling to be the protector of Mary, Jesus, and the church? By being constantly attentive to God, open to the signs of God's presence, and receptive to God's plans, not simply to his own. This is what God asked of David, as we heard in the first reading. God does not want a house built by men, but faithfulness to his word, to his plan. It is God himself who builds the house, but from living stones, sealed by the Spirit. Joseph is a protector because he is able to hear God's voice and be guided by his will. And for this reason, he is all the more sensitive to the persons entrusted to his safekeeping. He can look at things realistically. He's in touch with his surroundings. He can make truly wise decisions. In him, dear friends, we learn how to respond to God's call readily and willingly, but we also see the core of the Christian vocation, which is Christ. Let us protect Christ in our lives so that we can protect others, so that we can protect creation. The vocation of being a protector, however, is not just something involving us Christians alone. It also has a prior dimension, which is simply human, involving everyone. It means protecting all creation, the beauty of the created world, as the book of Genesis tells us, and as St. Francis of Assisi showed us. It means respecting each of God's creatures and respecting the environment in which we live. It means protecting people, showing loving concern for each and every person, especially children, the elderly, those in need, who are often the last we think about. It means caring for one another in our families, Husbands and wives first protect one another, and then as parents they care for their children, and children themselves in time protect their parents. It means building sincere friendships in which we protect one another in trust, respect, and goodness. In the end, everything has been entrusted to our protection, and all of us are responsible for it. Be protectors of God's gifts. Whenever human beings fail to live up to this responsibility, whenever we fail to care for creation and our brothers and sisters, the way is opened to destruction and hearts are hardened. Tragically, in every period of history, there are Herods who plot death, wreak havoc, and mar the countenance of men and women. Please, I would like to ask all those who have positions of responsibility in economic, political, and social life, and all men and women of goodwill, let us be protectors of creation, protectors of God's plan inscribed in nature, protectors of one another and of the environment. Let us not allow omens of destruction and death to accompany the advance of this world, but to be protectors, we also have to keep watch over ourselves. Let us not forget that hatred, envy, and pride defile our lives. Being protectors, then, also means keeping watch over our emotions, over our hearts, 
because they are the seat of good and evil intentions, intentions that build up or tear down. We must not be afraid of goodness or even tenderness. Here I would add one more thing. Caring, protecting, demands goodness. It calls for a certain tenderness. In the Gospels, St. Joseph appears as a strong and courageous man, a working man, yet in his heart we see great tenderness, which is not the virtue of the weak, but rather a sign of strength of spirit and capacity for concern, for compassion, for genuine openness to others, for love. We must not be afraid of goodness, of tenderness. Today, together with the Feast of St. Joseph, we're celebrating the beginning of the ministry of the new Bishop of Rome, the successor of Peter, which also involves a certain power. Certainly, Jesus Christ conferred power upon Peter, but what sort of power was it? Jesus' three questions to Peter about love are followed by three commands, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Let us never forget that authentic power is service, and that the Pope, too, when exercising power, must enter ever more fully into that service which has its radiant culmination on the cross. He must be inspired by the lowly, concrete, and faithful service which marks St. Joseph. And like him, he must open his arms to protect all of God's people and embrace with tender affection the whole of humanity, especially the poorest, the weakest, the least important, those whom Matthew lists in the final judgment on love, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, those in prison. Only those who serve with love are able to protect. In the second reading, St. Paul speaks of Abraham, who, hoping against hope, believed. Hoping against hope. Today, too, amid so much darkness, we need to see the light of hope and to be men and women who bring hope to others, to protect creation, to protect every man and every woman, to look upon them with tenderness and love is to open up a horizon of hope. It is to let a shaft of light break through the heavy clouds. It is to bring the warmth of hope. For believers, for us Christians, like Abraham, like St. Joseph, the hope that we bring is set against the horizon of God, which is opened up before us in Christ. It is a hope built on the rock, which is God. To protect Jesus and Mary, to protect the whole of creation, to protect each person, especially the poorest, to protect ourselves. This is a service that the Bishop of Rome is called to carry out, yet one to which all of us is called, so that the star of hope will shine brightly. Let us protect with love all that God has given us. I implore the intercession of Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, Saints Peter and Paul, and St. Francis, that the Holy Spirit may accompany my ministry, and I ask all of you to pray for me. Amen. Let us stand now and pray.